Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining one more lecture of our Processing in Memory course. Today is actually the last lecture of this semester. Uh, so uh, we're going to use it to first summarize some of the things that we have covered over the over this course. And, um, and, and also we will uh, explain uh, a, a couple more works that are uh, really important and really necessary to, in the end, enable the adoption of processing in memory, which is uh, uh, the main goal of uh, the research that we do and, uh, and one of the key goals of this processing in memory course as well. Uh, the course will uh, have a new edition in the next semester, in the spring semester, that we will probably start around the end of uh, last week of uh, February, February 2022. So everyone will be welcome to join um, as usual uh, to all this lecture. We will cover many of the interesting works that we have covered this, uh, in this semester and probably uh, new works as well um, that are uh, fruits of our recent research. So yeah, the title of today's lecture is how to enable the adoption of processing in memory. And that's uh, what we are going to talk about. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, ask me any questions over the course of the lecture. I will also uh, check from time to time the YouTube chat in case that there are questions there. Okay, so uh, what are the barriers that we need to skip in order to be able to uh, facilitate and enable the adoption of processing in memory. There are many things that we can uh, talk about. We will cover a few of them today, but uh, for now, let's uh, review this list here that I actually presented, I mentioned, I mean, or presented briefly in the, in the previous uh, lecture. The first one is the functionality of processing in memory and the applications and software uh, that we uh, need to develop for processing in memory. These are uh, some of the things that uh, we have to answer. Then how to program these processing in memory systems. What are the programming interfaces that we are going to use how are the compilers or the hardware support that is needed. Uh, then system support. In the end, we need to integrate end-to-end -end whatever processing in memory capabilities we have in our system. So this means that we will require some support from the system, for example, with respect to memory coherence or, for example, with uh, virtual memory management. Another uh, barrier is, uh, are the uh, runtime and compilation systems for adaptive scheduling, data mapping, sharing, and access control. We are going to talk about some of these today. And finally, infrastructures to assess the benefits and the feasibility of processing in memory. A few years ago, there were no even, not even uh, processing in memory simulators. So now uh, we are starting to produce processing in memory simulators that can be useful for uh, many researchers, same as uh, benchmark suites uh, for real uh, processing in memory um, uh, architectures and also for simulated architectures as well. So all these barriers can be skipped, can be solved with a change of mindset. And this change of, change of mindset should go from uh, the upper parts of the uh, stack, like the program and the algorithm, the way that we define the algorithms, the way that we program these algorithms uh, all, way, all the way down to the logic and devices. You have already seen examples like SIMDRAM where we um, change the way that we use the devices in order to enable some computation. This is just uh, one example. But in order to enable all, uh, I mean, the, the, the usage of processing in memory, we need to uh, do all this stuff, uh, stuff step by step. Uh, remember that the many of the um, you know, different topics that we have covered in this, uh, in this course, and also uh, some important ones that we are going to cover today, are uh, all collected in this book chapter, A Modern Primer on Processing in Memory, that you can uh, find already uh, in archive. It's uh, publicly available. And actually, the, uh, here you, you see the uh, beginning of the paper, the, the, the introduction of the paper, and the uh, a table of contents, and there is a whole section, section eight, that is devoted to uh, the different challenges that need to be solved to enable uh, the adoption of processing in memory. And we are going to go over all of these today. Remember as well that uh, we have a shorter version of the book chapter that was uh, published earlier. Is uh, this uh, paper published in the uh, MicPro journal, uh, Processing Data Where It Makes Sense, Enabling In-Memory Computation. 
And there is another version of these uh, summary papers uh, that uh, it's more focused on, uh, on workloads and, and programming needs. And, um, and, and here you can find also uh, the links to this publication. Okay, let's start uh, reviewing actually uh, what are real uh, PIM hardware systems and prototypes that we have uh, that we have uh, studied in this course. Remember that uh, several of the lectures of this course uh, have been um, spent on explaining the admin PIM architecture, also how to program this PIM architecture, and then and, and a study, uh, a st a studies of uh, um, the benchmarking and workload suitability. Remember that the admin PIM architecture consists of multiple DIMMs. In each team, we have several chips, and in each chip, we have memory arrays, but also we have simple processors called DRAM processing units or DPUs. Uh, if you want to, um, you know, you want to read review uh, uh, all our uh, lectures about um, the admin beam architecture, you can go to our website, but here you have a couple of links to meetings two and three where uh, we explain the microarchitecture and architecture of the of this beam system, uh, as well as a, a micro benchmark based study and analysis of, of the architecture. Another real world architecture that we discussed in the course was in DRAM. Remember that this one was based or is based on HVM2. It has uh, some uh, layers that uh, are compute capable. And in these layers, what we find are uh, PCU blocks that are processing elements, processing units that are connected to, uh, to the memory banks, right? And if and in, in, in this um, uh, slide, you can uh, see another view of the banks and the PIM units, the PCUs, and, um, and even a closer view of the PCUs, which in the end are SIMD units with 16 lanes and um, of, uh, with uh, 16 bits. Remember as well that we uh, covered FinDRAM in one of our lectures, and actually it was uh, meeting four. You, you can find a, a link to this lecture as well here. And the next uh, real world processing in memory architecture that we studied here is uh, AX Team, also a proposal from Samsung that is uh, DIM based. Um, remember that uh, in this uh, architecture, what we have is uh, some accelerators that are attached to the DRAM ranks. Uh, you might remember this um, slide uh, where we have rank zero, rank one, and here an FPEA that is in this in, 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 the, in the prototype they presented in their IEEE micro paper. This FPEA implements uh, like um, two accelerators, one uh, connected to rank, rank zero, the other one connected to rank one. Remember as well that the way that the host communicates with these uh, accelerators is by using the standard DDR4 interface and inside the, each of the accelerators we have buffers for instructions we have buffers for inter intermediate results we also have a, a unit to decode the instructions that come from the instruction buffer um, these uh, command generator unit that um, sends commands to to memory to the to the rank to access data from the rank and also um, uh, to access data from uh, these PSAM buffer. And finally, we also have here the other array that implements the necessary functionality. In particular, um, the application that we explained was uh, um, one uh, a specific function of uh, recommendation systems that is called SLS, and it's uh, highly memory intensive and also has pretty uh, trivial, pretty simple computations that can be uh, very uh, fastly executed here uh, in these uh, near rank accelerators. And here you can also see the executions, uh, execution flow. Uh, remember that first of all, we need to prepare the embedding tables right into the memory. Then we launch the execution on the memory side. And, um, and here uh, we have, like, let's say like the whole a pipeline that is executed in the uh, near rank um, um, accelerator, decoding, reading operands from memory or from the PSAM buffer, adding and writing and so on until uh, the point where the execution on the memory side is done and the, uh, that's detected by the CPU and the execution can uh, continue. If you want to uh, recall uh, the AXD architecture, I can recommend you the corresponding lecture, which was uh, in meeting five. 
And all these previous architectures that I just um, revealed are what we call processing near memory, because if you think about them, we place the processing elements near the memory arrays, but not exactly inside the memory arrays. Those kind of proposals are what we call uh, processing using memory. And remember that uh, according to our knowledge, there is no real world processing in memory system, uh, processing using memory system uh, yet, but there have been very um, interesting uh, experiences in the academic research, uh, in particular this uh, compute DRAM paper, where by using uh, the soft NC um, FPGA based uh, memory controller, they were able to execute uh, copy operations and also uh, book bitwise operations inside DRAM in a similar way as it had been proposed by previous works like Groklong and Ambit. Remember that um, by using- one? Yes. Um, so um, yeah, as I said, these compute DRAM were, uh, the, the authors of compute DRAM were able to, um, to uh, by, by using soft NC, were able to um, execute row clone and bitwise operations inside uh, real uh, DRAM chips, inside off the shelf chips. And um, this was relatively uh, simple or as simple as uh, playing with the timing parameters and violating timing parameters in order to copy one row from one row to another row or um, or executing these, or activating three rows in order to execute uh, bitwise operations. Remember as well that we presented uh, a project from us that is called PyDRAM that pro uh, provides a flexible platform to explore end-to-end -end implementations of processing using memory techniques. And uh, PyDRAM is an as I said, end-to-end uh, -end platform that uh, includes hardware components and software components as well, as you may remember from uh, this slide here. We implemented 5D RAM in an, uh, on FPEA. Um, essentially in the FPEA, we implement our RISC-V core and, um, and from that uh, core, we can access the compute enabled DIN, which in the end is um, um, off the shelf uh, DRAM memory that is um, uh, like um, uh, is compute capable because uh, we use the same ideas in the compute DRAM paper to enable uh, operations like row clone. But remember that uh, we had uh, Ataberg, the author, the, fir the first author of PyDRAM, uh, who was an invited speaker in our meeting six. And if you want to um, review this PyDRAM project, uh, I would recommend you this uh, lecture. And also remember that the paper is publicly available as well as the source code. So uh, hopefully many of you will find this um, PyDRAM platform as a useful tool for your own research. Okay, so after we have covered, let's say the real world uh, examples and prototypes, uh, we also talk in this course about how to program these architectures. Um, and uh, yeah, very uh, briefly remind you about the AppMem PIM system. Remember that the AppMem PIM system um, contains this uh, main memory that is a conventional DRAM uh, that keeps working as the main memory of the host CPU. And we also have the PIM enabled memory. Remember as well that programming this AppMem system is kind of a combination of a distributed system and a shared memory system. It's distributed from DPU to DPU because all the DPUs have access to their own memory space that is their MRAM. And, uh, but inside each of the DPUs, we have multiple threads up to 24 uh, tasklets or software threads that are uh, running and, um, and, and, and accessing uh, this um, single shared memory space that is this uh, DRAM bank. And remember as well that the tasklets running on the pipeline can synchronize and can communicate um, using synchronization primitives and using WRAN, which is the um, scratch pad for operands. Remember as well that programming the admin pin system requires us to use the accelerator model because we have to explicitly move data from the memory of the host processor to the memory of the accelerator. And we need to um, uh, explicitly launch the execution of the kernel onto the admin processors. Uh, here is a, a, you know, like a, a flow diagram of how this happens uh, that the one while the um, 
data is being data is being processed by the DRAM processors, by the DPUs. The CPU doesn't have access to the MRAM banks, but is continuously checking for the completion of the of the kernel. So it was important, remember as well, a key programming recommendation um, in the AppMem system was uh, to try to minimize the amount of communication or the communication needs across uh, the DPUs because all communication happens through the uh, host CPU and that's uh, quite costly according to uh, our analysis, at least for uh, specific benchmarks that really uh, require you know a lot of back and forth communication for example for redistribution of intermediate results we uh, talk about um, uh, interesting um, benchmarks for example bfs uh, for um, you know graph processing and if you want to uh, recall how to program the admin pim architecture uh, i can recommend your meeting aid or lecture aid uh, where we talk about it we also talk about uh, how to program a completely different architecture that is the uh, up the Simdiron framework. In the Simdiron framework, give me one second. Uh, in the Simdiron, the Simdiron framework is a, a framework for processing using memory. Remember that Simdiron allows us to create arbitrary completely new operations and, and uh, integrate them into the system by creating the corresponding sequence of commands of different commands and then um, uh, and, and, and having this enhanced memory controller that can read microprograms and start issuing the necessary commands to, to the different side in order to uh, execute the bulk bitwise operations. Um, and we also studied here how to program uh, the, uh, I mean, a SIMDRAM capable system using the SIMDRAM ISA extensions. Remember that uh, we have um, specific instructions for initialization or for predication. And then we also have uh, instructions with two or three input operands. Uh, no, actually it's one or two input operands um, and that are configurable, let's say we can uh, create different arithmetic operations or um, or even more complex ones. And uh, we covered this example here where we saw how to uh, compile or how to translate uh, some uh, C code, high level language code as uh, for example, this simple loop where we go over two arrays and depending on what's the value of one of the, 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 the value of the corresponding element of one of the arrays will perform an addition or a subtraction, right? And, and we were explaining how this translates um, into a sequence of uh, BB ops that are the uh, DRAM instructions. But if you want to uh, you know, recall, uh, Sindiram, uh, we also have a, a specific lecture about Sindiram, which was uh, lecture 10. And, and here you have the link to the uh, recording. Okay, I don't know if you have uh, any questions. If not, uh, I will continue. Uh, so, um, yeah, another uh, important thing to discuss here is to, uh, so how to, uh, so what, what should the uh, runtime in a system where what, what should do the runtime in a system where we have processing in memory capabilities. In the end, this runtime system um, is uh, responsible for doing scheduling, meaning uh, offloading computation to the PIM side whenever it makes sense to do that, and also uh, doing the necessary code and data mapping. And that will be very much dependent on the specific processing in memory system. We have uh, actually studied some uh, of these also in this course as well. I want to first uh, remind you one of the uh, proposals that we covered here and, um, and we can uh, extend a little bit more later. Remember that in our first lecture, we talk about uh, uh, PIM enabled instructions. That was uh, kind of a seminal work that proposed um, um, extending memory with very simple compute units that can execute individual instructions that are especially uh, memory bound, that are especially um, memory intense and require a, a lot of bandwidth consumption. We talk about the example of the page rank algorithm where remember the memory accesses are typically um, very uh, random 
while the computation itself is very lightweight, right? And you might remember this uh, slide where we see that uh, you know um, updating the rank of a specific node in our graph requires to probably read 64 bytes from memory and then write back these 64 bytes uh, for maybe just a single addition, right? And, 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 and the, the, the idea that uh, the PEI paper proposes is to replace these uh, update operations with uh, something like a specific instruction that is executed on the memory side in a way that we uh, reduce all of the amount of data movement. For example, for PageRank, we can reduce from 128 bytes in and out uh, from memory to only eight bytes in um, to memory. And this is an example PI, my, PI microarchitecture. Remember that our system um, is expanded with uh, some PCUs that are the units uh, that de dedicated to execute the PIM enable instructions. PCU here means PEI computation unit. But uh, the uh, interesting thing of this proposal as well it is that it does intelligent scheduler because it um, includes this locality monitor that can check where a cache line resides, whether in the uh, CPU cache hierarchy or in the main memory. And depending on that, it will uh, schedule the corresponding uh, PIM enable instruction either on the host processor or on the memory side. And by using this intelligent scheduling, it's possible to increase the performance improvements and the energy savings from this system. And I, uh, that's actually something that you can see here um, in this screen, in this um, slide. This is uh, for performance, and this is also for uh, the energy consumption. Notice how the locality aware um, execution, uh, it's um, it even outperforms uh, the PIM only um, approach, even with the largest data sets that don't fit in the, uh, the cache hierarchy of the CPU. And if you want to review the paper, remember that uh, here you have uh, links to these uh, paper slides and so on. But yeah, that, as I said, it's not the only uh, work that covers the needs for uh, doing intelligent scheduling, right? Uh, so in, in, in a completely different environment, in a GPU that might be extended with processing in memory capabilities, uh, we also need to deal with uh, where specific operations should be executed and how we need to map data in order for the processing in memory cores to access data in the most efficient way as well. So here in this um, figure, for example, you can identify a main GPU similar to the uh, ones we use these days connected to uh, different memory stacks, which is also something in common with uh, new, so with um, um, the, the current GPUs that use uh, HVM2 or HVM2E memory. And, um, and in the end, when, when we access data from the main GPU, we don't really care about where this data is, uh, is mapped because the main GPU has several memory controllers and depending uh, on where the um, some data, some array resides, it will use the corresponding memory controller to access the data. But uh, when we have a system like this that is um, extended with uh, GPU cores in the logic layer of the uh, memory stacks, it's important to first discuss or first to figure out where are we going to execute a specific uh, piece of code, whether in the main GPU or uh, in the um, GPU cores near the memory, or uh, also important thing here is how to map data. Because um, if you uh, have, let's say, certain uh, processing elements here that need to access data, uh, that uh, resides in the in the global memory of the GPU, you want that data be in the same stack because otherwise they these guys will have to go all the way to another stack, well, which probably uh, will take a, a, a significant latency and uh, and will be a, an, an important overhead for the execution of the program. So these uh, scheduling decisions and also these uh, data mapping decisions are 
very important uh, for the different processing in memory proposals and also might be a specific for the different processing in memory proposals as well. Hopefully we will be able to come up with, uh, let's say general rules on how to do scheduling on how to do uh, data mapping in order to uh, you know, like reuse these um, kind of uh, techniques or policies or heuristics for different systems. But anyway, in the meantime, you can uh, read this Tom paper that was presented at the DISCA 2016, and it's definitely a very interesting proposal. And a related proposal as well, also for uh, GPU architectures, is this uh, scheduling techniques for GPU architectures with processing in memory capabilities uh, that was also like, uh, contemporary with the previous one. Similar approach in some sense, but uh, the interesting difference between these two is that they uh, schedule code on, on the memory side or on the uh, regular uh, GPU side at different granularity. So there are um, different um, trade-offs and different design considerations that uh, it's worth uh, studying and, and comparing these two proposals. And uh, also uh, a couple more works uh, that uh, discuss and deal with this uh, scheduling of code. The first one is accelerating dependent cache misses with an enhanced memory controller. And the second one is continuous run ahead, transparent hardware acceleration for memory intensive workloads, uh, two highly recommended works as well. But uh, as I said, there is still a lot to do in, uh, in this topic, many research question, questions that still uh, we still need to answer. Um, some of them are, uh, related to the mechanisms to enable and disable PIM execution, depending on what are the uh, characteristics of the, the specific workload that uh, we are executing. Questions as well related to mechanisms to identify when parts of a um, particular application can benefit from processing in memory and performing the um, scheduling in the right manner as well. And also, uh, like, uh, other considerations related to, for example, how to share processing in memory engines, processing in memory cores, when we have the multiple requesting cores that might belong to the same application or maybe completely different processes. And, um, and, 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 and observe that these also opens not only um, uh, you know, like um, important, interesting, I mean, um, mechanisms for scheduling decisions, but also security considerations that need to be taken into account and, and hopefully will be um, studied as well um, in, in the near future. And um, uh, simple mechanisms as well, how to manage the access to a memory that serves both uh, CPU request and PIN request. And again, uh, this relates to efficient access to memory and also mm, there might be some security considerations as well. Okay, let's, um, yeah, let's uh, keep talking about the next of our topics uh, that, that we are going to cover uh, today. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that we need uh, system support to enable the adoption of processing in memory. And, uh, and uh, in, 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 among these um, different things in the system support, we need to provide memory coherence. We need to make sure that the data that is accessed by um, regular, I mean, by the host CPU and the data that is accessed by the processing in memory elements is the most up-to-date version of the most up-to-date copies of the data. And that's what the memory coherence mechanisms uh, should take care of. But implementing efficient memory coherence mechanisms in systems with processing in memory capabilities is not uh, straightforward. It's not that straightforward also in, uh, in, in, in multi-core systems, for example, with uh, no processing in memory capabilities. So it's even more complex when we have uh, processing in memory cores. And actually we did some uh, a study on these, uh, and, and, and here in this slide, for example, you can uh, compare the execution of uh, the performance of a process, I mean, CPU PIM system uh, containing, I mean, uh, implementing, let's say, traditional approaches to memory coherence, like uh, fine grain uh, memory coherence, for example, the MESI protocol, coarse grain memory coherence, or, or no coherence at all. And, uh, and you can uh, see here that the 
if they provide some speed up over the baseline is, um, is actually uh, pretty low only in this case. And actually they are very far from the ideal execution from the whole potential of processing in memory, right? That is this, uh, this uh, yellow bar. So it was uh, clearly necessary to, pro to provide, to propose a new mechanism to uh, maintain the coherence in a CPU PIM system. Uh, and, um, and, and our group published a couple of papers uh, about this. The first one was uh, lazy PIM, uh, and the second one was uh, Conda, an extension of this uh, lazy PIM proposal. I'm going to very briefly review or introduce you to uh, Conda in order for you to understand how we can enable um, coherent support in systems with near data accelerators or in general, um, processing in memory capabilities. So we know that uh, specialized accelerators are everywhere. And now we can talk about the new way of doing acceleration, acceleration that are near data accelerators or in general processing in memory systems. Um, the, uh, maintaining the coherence for uh, systems with processing in memory capabilities and CPUs is challenging. The first reason for that is that there is a large cost of, of chip communication. So whenever we need to maintain coherence between this compute unit and this uh, CPU, the cache hierarchy of this CPU, we are going to need to go through the memory bus. And as you know, this is where the uh, main problem of uh, current computing systems, or one of the key problems of current computing systems resides, the large cost of uh, the of chip communication. And also uh, PIM applications generate uh, a large amount of, of chip data movement. Uh, so it's impractical to use traditional coherence protocol. Um, existing um, coherence mechanisms are not good, as uh, we have seen in the in the in the previous plot, in the previous uh, graph, because these mechanisms eliminate a significant portion of the benefits of processing in memory, uh, because they uh, incur uh, a lot of of cheap uh, coherence traffic that is uh, in principle unnecessary, and um, and also because it would be possible to eliminate a lot of this uh, off chief traffic if the coherence mechanism had some insights into the memory uh, into the memory accesses so uh, the idea here is to propose an optimistic approach that can first of all gain insights before any coherence check happens and uh, performs only the necessary coherence request so we try to minimize as much as possible the, co uh, um, the uh, coherence traffic the communication uh, due to maintaining memory coherence and this is conda an optimistic mechanism that uh, enables uh, memory coherence in, in systems with processing in memory capabilities, uh, get, uh, avoiding all unnecessary coherence traffic. The key idea in Conda is to offload the PIM kernel to the PIM side and perform uh, optimistic execution on the PIM side, which means that there is no coherence request. We simply assume that things are gonna go well. And at some point, when the execution terminates on the pin side, we generate a signature that is somehow a um, collection of the memory accesses that the memory side has performed, like a, like a summary of the memory accesses that the memory side, uh, the pin side has performed. And this signature is sent to the CPU to be compared to the own signature of the CPU and and figure out whether there are any coherence problems or not. So this is why uh, we have here this coherence resolution stage uh, where the CPU decides uh, if the uh, optimism was good or not, right? So um, based on that, it will commit, let's say, uh, give um, the, uh, the, the execution on the PIM side uh, for completed and or uh, re-execute, meaning that uh, things didn't go well and we need to um, uh, like um, cancel, let's say, uh, the, the previous execution on the memory side and then uh, re-execute the game with valid uh, data. Uh, Conda showed very uh, interesting, very good performance and energy improvements, as you see, uh, very, very close to uh, the uh, ideal coherence mechanism. And I can yeah, recommend you to take a look at the paper that was presented at ISCA 2019. 
We have also talked in this course about another important topic that we uh, mentioned again today is the synchronization support. Uh, I don't really need to spend much time on this because our previous lecture was uh, about this, was synchron. Uh, there's a talk, interesting talk uh, that uh, Christina gave last Tuesday, but for those who were not uh, in the meeting, I would like to very quickly uh, go over Synchron as well. So Synchron proposes efficient synchronization support for processing in-memory architectures. We know that um, uh, synchronization is challenging for NDP systems and uh, prior schemes are not suitable or not efficient for uh, processing in-memory systems. And that's why we contribute uh, Synchron that, as you can see, uh, provides very good performance and energy results compared to an ideal zero overhead synchronization scheme. Synchronization is necessary, as you know, many important applications like graph analytics, for example, an application like single source, shortest path, we will need to acquire logs in order to and release them later in order to update some uh, common uh, data structure, like for example, this uh, array of distances that uh, tells us what's the distance between a specific node of the graph to the uh, source node, but uh, synchronization is also necessary in many more uh, applications as well. Uh, the, in, uh, we assume in this uh, synchron paper, as you may remember, a baseline NDP architecture that is composed by NDP units and each of the NDP units has multiple NDP cores. Observe that this is pretty similar to previous uh, architecture proposals like um, Tesseract or like even the, even the AppMem architecture itself is, uh, is kind of similar to this one. And, um, the main challenges that we have in this kind of system when it comes to synchronizing the different processing in memory cores is first of all, the lack of hardware cache coherence support. By the way, observe that in the previous uh, section of the lecture, we talk about coherence support, support but is coherence between the main CPU, the host CPU and the processing in memory side. Here we are talking about lack of coherent support uh, uh, in the processing in memory side it, itself across the different processing in memory cores. And uh, also the communication uh, across NDP units is expensive because in the end it's uh, off chip communication. And also because these are in general, we can consider them distributed systems. There is a, a lack of a shared level of uh, cache memory and also in, in general, uh, a lack of uh, shared memory. So many of the um, synchronization approaches that have been proposed in the past based on shared memory are not useful in this uh, environment, in this context. Uh, so message passing synchronization uh, approaches make much more sense. And here in Synchron, we uh, propose a specialized hardware that um, is going to um, you know, support uh, synchronization in these kind of systems. So, um, yeah, each of the NDP units is uh, extended with a synchronization engine. This uh, idea um, uh, skips any uh, complex coherence protocols, no need for atomic operations, and, 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 and actually it has a pretty low hardware cost. The synchronization unit, as you can see, is composed by um, the, a processing element, a processing unit, and also um, a synchronization table and indexing counters. In this synchronization table is where we are going to keep track of the uh, synchronization requests, uh, like for example, a log acquire coming from the NDP cores. And, um, and this is going to be pretty uh, efficient because there are no accesses to the, to the memory, to the uh, memory of the NDP unit. And it's also low latency because the synchronization engine is uh, right next to the NDP cores. And Synchron uh, allows us to, um, um, like, um, con uh, to, to do, to perform hierarchical communication. And what that means is that the synchronization engines in each NDP unit collect the synchronization request from the different uh, NDP cores. And then at some point they will send uh, like a global request uh, to a master synchronization engine that resides uh, in one of the uh, NDP units. So this uh, hierarchical approach minimizes expensive communication uh, as you can see. So in the end, Synchron uh, uh, provides high system performance, low hardware cost, 
programming is and uh, general synchronization support and also very um, good results with uh, compared to an ideal zero overhead uh, synchronization mechanism. Um, if you uh, want to learn more about Synchron, please uh, read the paper or for sure watch our previous lecture uh, as uh, that was uh, delivered by uh, Christina. Related to synchronization as well is the access to concurrent data structures. And, and, and in that sense, I can recommend you this uh, interesting paper uh, where uh, the authors explore how to implement efficient uh, concurrent data structures, like for example, FIFOs, linked link lists, skip lists uh, in processing in memory systems. And uh, another uh, important part of the system support that we need for the end to end integration of PIM systems or of PIM capabilities is the virtual memory support. And uh, again, same as uh, other topics or other aspects that we are covering today, like for example, the um, uh, scheduling, this might be, um, I mean, uh, the, the virtual memory support might need to be tailored for the specific PIM system, right? If you think about something like uh, PIM enable instructions and PIM enable instructions, uh, we are of loading individual instructions to the memory side. Uh, so in the end, um, doing the virtual to physical memory address translation, um, it's uh, relatively straightforward because it's for a single instruction. This uh, virtual to physical memory address translation can be done on the memory side, on the sorry, on the on the CPU side, and um, and when the instruction is offloaded to the memory side, we are only uh, we are offloading uh, the instructions directly with um, physical addresses, and that's uh, going to be pretty efficient because we don't need to worry about uh, virtual memory translation um, on the memory side, right? And um, if you think about um, like some uh, processing in memory coarse grain accelerators, such as, for example, Tesseract, or me, uh, even the uh, admin pin system, they are directly using um, the physical um, address space. Um, so the, there is no need for virtual memory support in those systems. But in other systems, especially in cases where we are going to have concurrent access from the CPU side and from the processing in memory side, or uh, we have a direct access, um, I mean, yeah, like, like the, 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 the processing in memory, uh, the, the, the PIM enabled memory is the main memory itself, uh, we need to have this virtual memory support. And as I said, um, the, the way that different works have uh, proposed virtual memory support depends on the specific needs of the particular proposal. Uh, today, I want to talk about one uh, interesting work, uh, interesting work that really, uh, you know, uh, pays a lot of attention to this uh, virtual to physical memory address translation because uh, it's a, a way of accelerating pointer chasing applications um, in the uh, in processing in memory and pointer chasing applications require. Uh, a lot of uh, memory accesses, usually very regular memory accesses that make more challenging to do this virtual to physical me memory address translation. And this um, is the, let's start with the executive summary of this uh, work, accelerating pointer chasing inside main memory is the main goal, but there are challenges. First of all is parallelism, second is uh, address translation challenge. As I said, uh, the solution is uh, uh, the, the, this uh, proposed in, in memory pointer chasing accelerator called uh, Impica. The key idea of uh, Impica is to do uh, address access decoupling. There are going to be two different units, one to calculate addresses, the other one to access um, the memory itself. And this enables parallelism in the accelerator with low cost. Um, um, the accelerator is uh, extended with a page table, a low cost page table in the logic layer uh, that uh, facilitates the uh, virtual to physical address translation. And as you will see, uh, quite interesting uh, performance results and uh, reduction in energy consumption with respect to the uh, baseline uh, CPU. But let's motivate a little bit. Uh, linked data structures are widely used in many important applications, like for example, databases, B trees, key value stores, hash tables, and so on. Uh, and these linked data structures are connected by pointers. So traversing 
these linked data structures requires chasing pointers. And here you have an example of what, what needs to be done by a CPU when it uh, needs to traverse a linked data structure. So for example, imagine that we want to find A and uh, we have this tree. So um, because uh, these different nodes of the tree are uh, connected using pointers, uh, we need to first access the first node, the root node, that is H, obtain the data, that is the contents of this node H. And there we have a pointer that points to the next node, the, the child E. So we have to go to memory to read E and bring E to the CPU. And then uh, we can access A and we can retrieve the data of A. So as you see, in order to find A, we have to perform uh, three accesses to memory, and we have to go back and forth three times, which is uh, pretty costly in terms of uh, latency, right? So we have serialized and irregular access patterns, especially because uh, these trees um, will have an irregular uh, or might have an irregular data structure. Uh, it's uh, likely that we will have irregular access patterns, so we cannot benefit so much uh, from the um, spatial locality. And, uh, and in the end, these uh, workloads might increase the number of cycles per instruction by up to six times, as, as, uh, as we saw in the motivation of this work. So the goal is to accelerate pointer chasing inside memory in a way that we can uh, save many of these memory accesses. For example, imagine that we need to find A in a system that is PIM enabled, it has compute capabilities in memory. If we need to find A, only thing to do is to send the request to the CPU, so, sorry, to the logic layer of the, um, in the memory side, assuming that we are using a, a three stack memory. There, we are going to have the accelerator that does the pointer chasing and then we can retrieve the data. And as you see, instead of having three accesses to memory, as we saw in the previous um, uh, example, here uh, we only have a, a single access. And um, but there is a parallelism challenge. Why is that? Because normally when we have CPU cores, we'll have to, I mean, we first compute, then we access memory, then we compute again. And usually these accesses to memory, as you know, they take much longer than the computation. Um, and in an, in memory accelerator, we can at least, uh, uh, you know, reduce significantly the latency of these memory accesses, right? And this, uh, it's great because gives us some uh, potential for, um, it uh, it's, uh, gives us some potential for performance improvement. It can be faster for one operation. But the point is that um, in CPU or in, in, in the, the host system, we may have different, many uh, CPU cores and these CPU cores can execute in parallel, right? And they can access memory in parallel as well. So if we do the same or if we try to do two accesses in the memory accelerator, in the end, we will have to do them one by one. And what that means is that um, it will be slower for two operations, right? Because we cannot parallelize uh, the execution as we do from the CPU side. So the opportunity here is designing the accelerator in a nice way in order to save uh, a lot of uh, latency, a lot lot of time when uh, accessing memory. So notice that the access to memory itself is uh, usually uh, much longer than the computation. And so here, the idea is to decouple the accelerator, the, the, the uh, pointer chasing accelerator in a way that it has two different engines. The first one is the address engine. The second one is the access engine. With the address engine, we perform computation and calculate addresses that are going to to be used by the access engine in order to access memory. So this way we can exploit the parallelism and we can overlap the accesses, I mean the computation and the accesses uh, to memory. And this way we will end up saving a significant amount of time with respect to the execution on the CPU. So this uh, address access decoupling enables parallelism in both engines with low cost. Um, here you can see a, like a simplified representation of the Impica core architecture with the address engine, with the access engine. In the, in the middle, we have an access queue for them to communicate with each other and a response queue. And, um, and they also are also um, uh, extended with a, a small uh, cache uh, that, um, you know, 
uh, can uh, save some of the accesses to the to the DRAM. So when it comes uh, to integrate this in peak accelerator into the system, we will have the CPU sending requests to the uh, accelerator, like for example, this traversal one and traversal two that will go all the way through the address engine and the access engine. And from the access engine, they will uh, go to the uh, DRAM, bring some data back and uh, move it to the address engine, as you see. So this is more or less how the uh, Impica core is going to work with the uh, decoupled engine, as you, as you see. But now there is another challenge at this uh, address translation. So in general, in CPUs, we use TLBs, we use the memory management unit to perform the address translation. So if we have a pointer individual in, in the virtual uh, memory address space, uh, we will have to do page walks. We'll have to go to the page uh, table. And, um, and this means normally we have several levels of page tables. So normally we will have to uh, perform several walks, right? And, and these require several memory accesses, four memory accesses in the example that we have just seen in the slide. Um, and in the end, we will obtain the physical address. But as you see, uh, this is uh, pretty costly from the host side. Uh, and also one problem is that if for, for our um, Impica core, uh, it's, it's going to be an issue because there is no TLB, TLB or, or memory management unit on the memory side. And duplicating them is going to be costly and also creates uh, compatibility issues. Um, uh, the, the, the page table walk requires multiple memory accesses as you have seen. So uh, we uh, should try to come up with a better solution for this. Um, so the key idea is to decouple the page table of the Impica side of the accelerator from the page table of the CPU, or um, in a different, uh, express in a different manner, uh, part of the page table of the CPU is reserved to the uh, processing in memory side, what we call the uh, Impica region. So what that means is that all virtual pages that are going to uh, be used by the or accessed by the um, Impica accelerator, the Impica core, um, are going to reside in this uh, Impica region in the uh, virtual address space. And then they can be mapped in whatever in the physical address space. Um, so in the end is uh, what we call a partial to any mapping, partial because we are not considering the whole virtual address space, but just a, a region of it that is assigned to the, um, to the uh, Impica accelerator. And here uh, you can see how to access, um, I mean, how to uh, obtain the physical address uh, in, in, in a much simpler way as, as it's done with the page table workers in a, in a CPU. We just need to use the addresses uh, I mean, the bits uh, in the virtual address to um, access the, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the bits that uh, the, for, for the uh, Impica region, then we have this flat page table that is for large pages of two megabytes. And then we have a small page table for smaller pages of four kilobytes. And this way we obtain the physical address because this uh, region table is pretty small. It, it's mostly, um, mo most of the time you're going to reside in the Impica cache. And then uh, this flat page table um, saves one memory access because it's handling uh, these um, uh, large pages. Uh, here you see the evaluation methodology and uh, some um, performance results. This is the speed up of Impica with respect to uh, our baseline, a CPU with an extended, with a larger L2 in order to do a fair comparison. And we see uh, pretty interesting speed ups up to 90% uh, faster execution on the, on the memory side for linked lists. Uh, this is like a, um, let's say more real world uh, benchmark that is a, a database uh, like with two different baselines. We see that the um, Impica is um, like significantly faster and, uh, and also uh, reduced latency as well. And in terms of energy consumption, we also see similar trends for the database and also for the micro benchmarks as well. Uh, kind of pretty interesting uh, energy savings. And the area and power overhead is uh, relatively 
uh, as small as you can see in this slide. But if you want to uh, see all the details of uh, this in PICA proposal, please take a look at the paper presented at ICCB 2016. But that's not the only work that, uh, as I said before, deals with virtual memory and processing in memory systems. Um, in the end, virtual memory requires a lot of thinking, requires a lot of uh, redesigning um, the virtual memory system in order to adapt it to a system that now has compute capabilities on the memory side, right? And one proposal that in our opinion uh, can be very, very beneficial in this context and can help uh, a lot for these kind of processing in memory proposals is the virtual block interface. And as, as you know, in a, in a conventional memory system, in a conventional uh, virtual memory system, we have a virtual uh, we have kind of a monolithic virtual address space, right? Where each of the processes running on the system have their own virtual address space. All the all of them are same size. They need to use uh, page tables. Uh, we have seen in the um, um, previous slides, these page table walks are um, extremely costly. So this, uh, let's say traditional approach doesn't seem the best fit for new application, I mean, new scenarios such as uh, processing systems with processing in memory capabilities or virtualized uh, environments or systems with, um, um, with hybrid memories that require hybrid memory management and so on. And so what BVI proposes is to um, have um, different uh, BVI address spaces that can be accessed by different processes as well. And, uh, and also these uh, BVI uh, address spaces are uh, completely configurable. These are the virtual blocks that are the, I mean, have a, um, a size and characteristics as def defined by the processes and required by the users. And then we have a memory translation layer in the memory controller that um, performs many of the operations that uh, still these days are done by the uh, CPU, by the, uh, um, by the OS in software and are uh, extremely costly. So this is kind of an efficient solution for many modern systems and, and hopefully it will be uh, you know, widely applicable in the future as well. But if you want to learn about the virtual block interface about BBI, please watch this uh, lecture that Nastar and the first author of BBI gave uh, last, last um, fall semester. Okay, now uh, we come up to uh, these security considerations. So we are uh, extending the system with new processing uh, execution capabilities or computing capabilities. And, 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 and in the end, we are placing processing elements closer to the memory, and we may have uh, different processes using these processing uh, elements, right? So this uh, creates new uh, security concerns that for sure uh, we will need to deal, uh, deal with. But also, uh, we cannot forget that for this uh, processing in memory systems uh, give us also new opportunities uh, in terms of security, right? And in that sense, uh, processing in memory systems can also be used to uh, support new security primitives that can make our system more secure and more reliable. And in that sense, our group has proposed uh, several works to um, generate uh, physically unclonable functions or random numbers in memory that can uh, clearly benefit the security of uh, the, the, the overall system, right? Um, the, the, the first of these ideas, the DRAM latency path is based on uh, the, you know, um, exploiting the random process variation that comes from manufacturing in real means that there are some cells that have high probability uh, of uh, high percentage, percentage of our chance to fail uh, with reduced TRCD, while others have uh, much less uh, probability of, uh, of error with, uh, with reduced TRCD if we reduce the uh, timing parameters here. And um, by uh, taking advantage of this characteristic and their random process variation from manufacturing, it's possible to create physically and clonable functions that are repeatable and unique uh, device signatures that can uh, identify a system or can identify uh, um, a DRAM beam and, uh, and make it uh, 
let's say, trustable. This is uh, the paper. And, uh, and similar to the, to the DL path, to the different latency paths, is the D range key idea also based on random process variation, extracting random values by observing DRAM and, um, and also taking advantage of the uh, different probability of failure for uh, the reduced TRCD for different uh, cells, right? And, and based on that, it's also possible to obtain, uh, to extract random values uh, from the room. And here you have the, the paper that was presented at HVCA 2019. And more recently, another proposal from more group also generates random numbers by using similar ideas to those ex uh, provided, those exploited um, in the compute DRAM paper that I mentioned before. Uh, the observation here is that carefully engineered DRAM commands can activate four rows in, their, in real DRAM chips. Like um, when reducing the time and parameters, the latency between an activate and a pre-charge command and the next activate command, uh, when using uh, violating timing parameters, uh, it's possible to activate four rows with these two uh, activate commands. The idea is to have uh, four different rows. Uh, some of them contain one, and others, uh, other, the other two contain zero. And, um, and, um, and this is the um, steady state, let's say, where uh, the, the voltage of the bit line is uh, half BDD. And um, we have this uh, uh, threshold voltage. Um, um, and, 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 and the idea in this operation is to first uh, or in Quack, the idea is to first activate one row, row zero, uh, then pre-charge before uh, we reach the threshold voltage, then activate another row, in this case, row three, and then at some point, uh, we enable the sense amplifiers. So the point is that uh, at this, uh, the, the, or the thing is that at this point in time, what happens is that uh, we obtain a random perturbation and this random perturbation can even go up or go, da go down. That is, it can, um, it can uh, go to logical one or logical zero in the, in the sense amplifier. And this is a way of generating uh, random values. So um, the idea is to, um, uh, leverage these uh, random values on the sense amplifier generated by the quark operations are as a source of entropy. So this is what we call a DRAM segment for uh, different rows containing zeros and ones, as we have seen before. Um, in the second step, we perform the quadruple row activation, and uh, and this generates the, val the random values, logic one and logic zeros. Now what we do with the contents of the sense amplifier uh, is uh, dividing them into 256-bit Shannon entropy blocks. And these Shannon entropy blocks are used to generate the true random numbers, 256-bit true random numbers. So that's essentially the idea uh, of Quack. And as you see, Quack is a very good example of how to generate random numbers in a simple manner using uh, conventional DRAM chips, but also uh, it's a nice way of showing what are the potential of uh, the potentials of uh, processing in memory to uh, uh, provide new security primitives that can um, increase and enhance the security of the whole system. Okay, uh, something that uh, we have also talked about in the course are benchmarks and simulation infrastructures. And that's also something uh, very much uh, important and interesting for enabling the adoption of processing in memory. Why is that? First of all, we need uh, simulation infrastructures to uh, explore or research ideas, to um, try if they are good or not, to find what are the cases where they are good or not. And also we need benchmarks, first of all, to run on these simulators uh, for us to see what's the, what are the potential performance and energy benefits uh, from our uh, architecture proposals, but also to compare real systems and also why not 
to serve as examples for future users, uh, users as well and future uh, programmers of these processing in memory systems. And this is why we have worked uh, in this direction as well and why we have uh, covered this direction in this uh, course as well. And, and one good example are the print benchmarks that I presented a few weeks ago. Remember that uh, here we have a collection of 16 benchmarks from uh, different fields like dense and sparse linear algebra, databases, data analytics, etc. And these benchmarks are open source and publicly available in our repository, as you can see. But print benchmarks are not the only one. Here you have also a lecture where I presented and discussed the analysis of, uh, of these print benchmarks on the admin PIM system. But as I said, these print benchmarks are not the only ones that we have developed. We also uh, presented in this work the DAMOVE um, uh, work, a new methodology and benchmark suite for evaluating data movement bottlenecks. And here, it's not only the methodology to characterize uh, the bottlenecks and, and, and remember that we found six different classes of uh, bottlenecks, some of them uh, can be way uh, uh, very much alleviated by using processing in memory capabilities, but well, in some cases it depends on the um, a specific workload, in other cases we found that one of the classes is uh, compute bound and, and, and these kind of applications are better to be executed on the host system. They don't really benefit from processing in memory. But yeah, as I said, uh, not only this um, uh, methodology to characterize the workloads, but also a product of this method of this um, uh, work was uh, the benchmark suite with more than a hundred uh, benchmarks that are publicly available as well, and uh, the simulator that we used in, in this study. So you can uh, find all of that in the paper, you can find uh, everything in the repository as well. And remember that uh, Geraldo presented the move um, in uh, meeting seven, if you want to check it for your own reference. It's not the only simulator, the Damove simulator is not the only simulator that uh, we have uh, publicly released. Before that, uh, a couple of years uh, earlier, we also, um, we also released the uh, processing in memory version of Ramulator. Ramulator is a, a widely used uh, DRAM simulator. We extended Ramulator to support uh, PIM operations. And, uh, and there are also uh, other uh, nice simulators from our group that are also publicly available, like for example, MQSIM that is for SSDs and can also be um, extended for processing in memory or processing in SSD. Uh, but simulators might not be the best uh, solution depending on what we want to explore or what we want to experiment with, right? Why is that? Because in the end, a simulator is a relatively a bulky tool that needs to run on a CPU and, um, and, and, and simulating a whole system by a program that runs on a, on a CPU might take uh, a, a lot of time, right? Even though it's, uh, it's uh, very good because we are going to uh, obtain a lot of in uh, details, a lot of metrics and insights. We will be able to generate insights from our simulation results. It might not be the best solution uh, in all cases. That will depend on what is the specific purpose that we are targeting. Like for example, um, if you want to figure out whether uh, an application is good or not for processing in memory, one, and, 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 and you don't have access to a real processing in memory or to the type of processing in memory that you want to evaluate, then you need to use a simulator, right? But if instead of one uh, specific application with one specific data set, you have thousands of them, uh, then, uh, doing this analysis on a simulator might take too long, right? And, um, and, and in these cases, if we are able to come up with some simpler models that can already provide insights on, for example, pin suitability, that's going to be much better. And that's what uh, we tried in this um, uh, NAPL work that uh, provides a, uh, a performance and energy prediction tool based on machine learning, in particular based on ensemble learning. Let me very briefly introduce you to this uh, NAPL work. So the motivation is, of course, to use uh, processing in memory or near memory computing, which is uh, essentially the same thing as the, the different name for the same thing. The problem is that simulation times are extremely slow 
imposing long runtime, especially in the early stage design space exploration. For example, if you uh, want to try new architectural ideas, or as I said before, if you want to explore the uh, processing in memory suitability or a particular workload simulation might take too long for our goals. So our goal in this work is to provide a quick high level performance and energy estimation framework for uh, processing in memory architectures. And that's our contribution, NAPL, a fast and accurate performance and energy prediction for previously unseen applications using ensemble learning. So this works with completely new applications that we haven't used to train the uh, ensemble learning uh, method or, or something like that. Uh, we use intelligent statistical, techni statistical techniques and micro, uh, micro architecture independent application features to minimize the experimental runs. And in the or evaluation, we observe that uh, NAPL is more than 200 times faster than um, a state of the art processing in memory simulator with also very low error rates in terms of uh, performance and energy estimation. So, uh, as we have seen before, uh, simulation for design space exploration or analysis of workload stability. There are several simulators uh, out there, but all, but, but all of them are, are pretty slow, right? Uh, up to 10,000 times is lower than the execution on a real system. So that's why we want to leverage here the uh, uh, ML with the statistical techniques in order to be able to do predictions in a uh, much faster manner. So NAPL has uh, two sides. I mean, first of all, we need to train the model and then uh, we will do inference in, let's uh, first of all, take a look at how we train the model. Uh, in the training, uh, we have a phase one that is the L it's an LLVM based kernel analysis that um, essentially obtains information about the instruction mix in your program about the memory behavior, like for example, uh, how memory intense is this um, workload or other metrics like instruction level parallelism. And we have a phase two where we do microarchitecture simulation. First of all, we generate traces from our program, from, from our application, um, and then we do trace simulation. Here, in order to keep this microarchitecture simulation lightweight and not have to use a a huge amount of uh, data in our data sets, in our training data sets, uh, we apply a technique that is called design of experiments in order to minimize the number of experiments that we need to do um, in the data collection. And then by using the information obtained from phase one and phase two, either which are application features and also uh, the, 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 the knowledge uh, from the microarchitecture like instruction per cycles and hardware features, we can uh, train the uh, ensemble learning algorithm. And then, yeah, so here among the application features, we have uh, instruction mix, uh, instruction level parallelism, reuse distance, memory and register traffic, and memory footprint. And among the architecture features, we have so core types, number of processing elements, frequency, cache line size, different layers, uh, cache access fraction and DRAM access fraction. So this uh, relates to um, hits and misses in the cache here. Okay, so these are the characteristics that are used or the features that are used to train uh, the ensemble learning algorithm. And once the ensemble learning algorithm is trained, the only thing that we have to do in the prediction is to apply the LVM kernel analysis to obtain instruction mix, memory behavior, ILP, and these application features from our new application, fit them into the uh, prediction model and directly obtain performance and energy estimates that are um, you know, based on our model and based on the uh, previously and the, the training that we did previously. So this is the evaluation, the evaluation methodology. Here we used uh, um, we compare to uh, a state-of-the-art simulator. Uh, by that time, it was uh, Ramulator PIN, the processing in memory version of Ramulator. And, um, and we used uh, different workloads from Polybank, Rovinia, ben Benchmark Suites. And here you can see, uh, like, uh, so this is like the NAPL accuracy uh, in terms of performance prediction and in also the energy prediction. NAPL is the uh, darker blue uh, bar, as you see uh, in, 
if not all cases, almost all cases, NAPL performs better than uh, decision tree and an artificial neural network. So um, as you see, pretty uh, accurate uh, for the performance and energy estimates. And also uh, pretty fast, you can uh, check the details in the paper, but uh, in, on average, uh, 220 times faster than the um, state-of-the-art simulator and up to more than a thousand times faster uh, for some of the uh, workloads. And uh, we also include one use case in the paper that is a processing in memory suitability study. Um, uh, yeah, so the, that, and, and we also observe that very good accuracy in terms of uh, prediction, right? That, that, so actual um, EDP reduction here is the lighter blue on, a, on the simulator. And this is uh, what we predict, uh, the darker blue is what we predict uh, with the uh, NAP. And this is the paper presented at DAC 2019 and part of the uh, PhD thesis of uh, Garan. Okay, uh, yeah, I think uh, we are uh, close to the end. Uh, thank you very much for attending this uh, long lecture. Uh, one of the things that processing in memory also enables is to you know, discover new applications that can um, benefit from processing in memory and can greatly increase their performance and reduce their energy consumption based on uh, processing in memory. And this can enable uh, you know, even new applications. So for example, this uh, green filter is a, a proposal for uh, seed, location, uh, seed location filtering in, in DNA read mapping using processing in memory. Um, this kind of proposal can, you know, enable um, new use cases uh, for many applications. If you are able to perform one particular application or execute one particular algorithm much faster in a processing in memory system and also do it uh, saving a lot of energy, you are probably enabling, enabling um, a new use cases. Like for example, uh, being able to, uh, to perform sequence alignment and, and read mapping operations in device, uh, in, in mobile devices that can be uh, pretty useful in certain environments. Um, in the end, uh, well, in this particular case, Green Filter uh, works with uh, one of the stages of the uh, genomics pipeline, that is the, the filtering step. Um, the idea is to accelerate uh, this uh, filtering step and accelerate the read ma mapping operation that is a approximate the stream matching problem. And this uh, stream matching problem is pretty costly, it's very, expensive, right? Um, do by doing it in memory with the green filter, it's possible to greatly accelerate uh, read mapping and uh, by reducing the number of required alignments. And as you can uh, find in the paper, it provides a speed up of up to uh, 3.7 times with respect to the baseline um, uh, processor. Another uh, related work here is uh, Genasem. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, as well a new algorithm and also a new accelerator, processing in memory accelerator for accelerating um, approximate stream matching in sequence alignment. Or uh, in another work, this one, Google Workloads for Consumer Devices, presented at ASPLOS 2018 and part of the thesis of uh, Amirali. Uh, we here also showed how uh, processing in memory can be very beneficial for uh, consumer mobile devices and how important applications in these uh, consumer devices, like for example, video encoding and video decoding or neural networks can be greatly accelerated by using processing in memory capabilities or how to accelerate uh, climate modeling at uh, another um, proposal and, and, and near processing in memory or near HVM memory um, uh, accelerator for stencils to accelerate the Cosmo model uh, for climate modeling, also part of uh, Gagan's thesis as well. Or this uh, uh, NATSA, another processing in memory accelerator for time series analysis, a class of applications that have 
uh, or a class of algorithms that have uh, applications in different fields, like for example, sequence alignment, um, um, medical applications like electrocardiograms, or even uh, you know earthquake earthquake detection, and so in the end, whatever whatever has a time series that can that needs to be um, analyzed in a in a fast and efficient manner can benefit from this kind of accelerator or at least the execution uh, near memory because these are very highly memory intensive applications. Okay, so yeah, I guess that I covered uh, most of it. Now it's like the time to, uh, for the epilogue, time to conclude uh, this lecture and also to conclude uh, the, um, the course uh, observed that uh, over the course of these 12 weeks, uh, we have covered many different topics related to real world processing in memory architectures, how to program them, what are workloads that can benefit from processing in memory, how to identify what are these workload char characteristics that make them good or bad uh, for processing in memory and so on. And in the end, um, and also as I said in the beginning of the, of the lecture today, uh, our goal is to enable processing in memory, to continue doing uh, academic research, to continue inspiring people uh, to do their own research and to, uh, to come up with their own proposals to make, um, you know, uh, to make this uh, processing in memory paradigm uh, real, to make, it, to make it feasible, and, and hopefully at some point to find it in many more um, real world systems than what we can uh, find today at the end of 2021. I'm pretty sure that in one year, in two years, uh, we will see processing in memory capabilities in many more systems from servers to uh, mobile devices. And, and, and this definitely is going to change the way we compute and the way that we think about computation and we plan for computation as well. Um, remember that um, first reference that I would recommend to everyone is this uh, book chapter um, that we uh, published this year. It um, con uh, in contains a, a large and comprehensive summary of many um, state-of-the-art uh, proposals in processing in memory and also discusses many of the open problems and things that still need to be uh, done in order to enable the adoption of processing in memory as we have discussed uh, in today's lecture. Remember as well that we have shorter versions of this uh, book chapter uh, this uh, older one, Micro, uh, and, and published in 2019, and this uh, other one that is more uh, focused on workloads and programming is. Uh, remember that processing in memory is a challenge and an opportunity for the future. The opportunity is to build fundamentally energy efficient computing architectures that are data centric and also uh, not only energy efficient, but also high performance. The goal, the ultimate goal is to uh, create uh, computing architectures with minimal data movement, and we are getting closer and closer to this uh, ultimate goal. Uh, if you want to keep learning about uh, processing in memory, I can recommend you many workloads, many <laughs> talks uh, from um, uh, Professor Mudlu, like for example, this, uh, this one, memory-centric uh, computing systems. And, uh, and here you have uh, the link uh, to this uh, workload, uh, highly recommended, as I said. And, um, and also, uh, you know, keep uh, tuned, uh, keep in touch with us. If you want to discuss anything, you want to ask uh, anything related to the contents of this course or uh, related to the research that we are doing um, in this topic, and um, I would like to invite everyone to join uh, the next edition of the course that, uh, as I said in the beginning, will take place in spring 2022, uh, hopefully around end of, end of February is uh, when we will start. Okay, I think I don't see uh, any questions in YouTube, also no questions in Zoom. So I just uh, need to thank everyone uh, for attending, uh, for being interested in, in the different uh, topics that we have covered in this course, different aspects of processing in memory. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, all these lectures, you found them useful and instructive. 
and uh, I wish you uh, nice holidays and a very good start of the new year. Thank you very much for your attention. See you soon.